Beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 8, Psalm 78, verses 1 through 8. This has been called a contemplation of Asaph, who is the writer of this particular psalm. Beginning at verse 1, the psalmist writes, Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, telling to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and His strength and His wonderful works that He has done. For He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which He commanded our fathers that they should make known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, the children who would be born, that they may arise and declare them to their children, that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments, and may not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not set its heart aright and whose spirit was not faithful to God. As we look at this, this is a psalm that is intended to make the reader think concerning the great works of God and to remember how God has worked in history. And the obvious message of Psalm 78 as we begin our study is uh, do not forget what God has done because if you keep in your mind what God has done, then it's going to give to you strength today and give you hope for tomorrow. And if you remember the things that God has, has, has shared with us, told us, or revealed to us in His Word, if we remember those things and if we take those things to heart, if we actually obey the things that we know, then God is going to bless our life. These kinds of things that God gives to us in His Word is intended to keep us from sin. And remembering those things will help our life to be pure. In the Proverbs, in uh, chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, the writer said, My son, do not forget my law. Let your heart keep my commands. For length of days and long life and peace they will add to you. And that's what we're looking at here when the psalmist says, Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old. He goes on to say, Which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, telling to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and His strength and His wonderful works that He has done. And so the point is obvious. God has worked in our life and God has worked in our history. And so as a believer, as a believing parent, and that's what you're basically looking at when it speaks concerning uh, not hiding these things from, from our children and all, as a believing parent and as, as a believing grandparent, we have the responsibility of passing on the things that God has given to us. We have the responsibility of taking what God has revealed to us in His Word and communicating those things through our life and through our teaching to those whom we love the most, which would obviously be our children and grandchildren. It's been said it is not better teachers, texts, or curricula that our children need most. It is better childhoods. And we will never see lasting school reform until we see parent reform. And I believe that God wants to do a work in parents as well as grandparents because we have the responsibility of communicating these things to future generations. He's saying that in verse 5 when he says, He established a testimony in Jacob, appointed a law in Israel. What is that law that he appointed? Well, he commanded this to our fathers that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them the children who would be born, that they may arise and declare them to their children, and that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments, and may not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not set its heart aright and whose spirit was not faithful to God. And so he's basically saying that faith is communicated and is intended by God to be so. It's communicated through your lifestyle. Your children, your grandchildren, those who know you best, watch the way that you live. Obviously, you're a living epistle. You are the Bible that comes alive to them as they watch the way that you live amongst them, especially we who are parents. We who are parents live the gospel before our children. We not only tell them what to do, and we'll look at that in just a moment, but we, we simply do that which we are supposed to do because our kids are going to basically model themselves after the lifestyle 
that they have had communicated to them over a lifetime. They learn our ways. They, they learn the things that make us who we are. They see the things that are valuable to us. They watch the way that we relate to one another and all of that. And so, one of the things that we do, obviously, is we communicate through our lifestyle, the good works that we perform, the generosity that we might extend to other people, the affection that we show one to another, the fun that we can have as a family. These are all things that go into the life of the children that we're raising. We put these things all together, and our children grow up in, in this medium. This is what their life is. This is what it's all about to them. This is the way families are. As they watch that very closely, and they own those things. And those things are very important to them. A second thing that we do is we explain those things to our kids. We conscientiously do so. They want to know sometimes why we are the way that we are. And so we pass on the things of God, not simply as we live before them for God, but by an explanation, we tell them why we do these things. We do these things because God has given to us instructions in His Word. Now, I do these things that you see me do because as I read the Bible, God, through His Word, declares His mind to me, and, and God, through His Word, guides me, and by His Holy Spirit, empowers me, and that's why I do the things that I do, the things that are good are from the Lord. The Bible tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 9, take heed to yourself, diligently keep yourself, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Teach them to your children and to your grandchildren. Teach your children these things, and he says, and love your grandchildren enough to communicate them to your grandchildren also. You know, we do those kinds of things now with our grandson. You know, um, my Josiah is very loved and knows it. You know, I, I'll be careful not to go on a Jos Josiah rampage with you, but it's true. <laughs> um, he's a very affectionate baby with me. You know, he kisses, he holds me now. You know, when I come walking in, just today he was here, and when I come walking in and he sees Gramps, you know, he raises his hands and, and and comes to me and I put him in my arms and he immediately places his head on my shoulder and just hugs me and, and man, I am raptured, I'm in heaven, it's just such a wonderful feeling and he's learning, he's learning that, 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 that he can be loved and he's learning how to give love. That's how it works. And, and his grandma, uh, Marie, will Will uh, before he eats, she'll take him by the little hand, and his mama does this too, take him by the little hand and say, thank you, Jesus, for this food, amen, you know, and then begins to feed him and overfeed him, and, and that's how it works, right? <laughs> that's how it works. And, and he learns these things, and as he grows older, as our children grew older, we would attempt to communicate to them why we do this through devotions, through prayer, through conversations, you know, through a variety of means, coming to church, serving the Lord, giving to God, all of those things. And, and that's the life that they learn, and, and that's how you communicate these things. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 7, uh, Moses writes, you shall teach them diligently to your children. Uh, you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and, and when you rise up, may it, may it be the entire atmosphere of their life. You see, it only takes one generation to begin to stop the movement of the Holy Spirit. It takes a generation who forgot to give to the generation coming up the things that God had done in their life. And, you know, as I look back over the years that I've walked with the Lord now, coming out of what was referred to even by Time magazine as the Jesus movement and the Jesus revolution, there are numbers of people who were veterans of that movement who got saved back in, in the early 70s, late 60s and all, and, and would call themselves Jesus freaks and all of that who failed to communicate to the children. It reminds me of Judges chapter 2, verse 10, when speaking concerning the death of Joshua and his generation, the Bible says, all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, and another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord nor the work which he had done for Israel. You begin to think, what is happening in this nation that we love so much? What is happening 
in the United States of America, even as I speak. And I was thinking about that just today. And I'm wondering how we got to the point that we have gotten to. And I was writing just a few things down uh, about this. This is the nation that we live in, and I think that we're in critical season. I believe that God wants to do a new work, and I think He wants to use the church to do that work because we're seeing a nation that is basically on our coinage says we trust in Him, but in reality the nation doesn't. Uh, we think of recent things in the newspaper that we've read and all about, about uh, attempting to, to ban uh, God out of the Pledge of Allegiance, for example. And there are people who are, are joining together to say that you shouldn't use the word God in the Pledge of Allegiance and all of that, but they're the same people who fight for a partial birth abortion and the same ones who, who fight for the rights of homosexuals to marry. Uh, we fight to allow uh, underage teenagers, teenage girls, to leave campus to receive abortions, but will not allow them to buy cigarettes or alcohol. We won't allow them to see certain movies or get their ears pierced. But if they're pregnant and they're in school without a parental consent, they can be taken off campus and they can receive an abortion. We do not allow creation science to be taught in school. We teach evolution as fact. And then we get angry at kids for acting like animals at their graduation. We've been teaching them that's all they are for the last 13 years of their life and then wonder why they act that way. We as a nation actually minimize the status of women who desire to remain at home and care for their children. And yet we wonder why young people today are so rude and lack basic manners. Who's teaching the kids manners? Who's teaching them to be polite? Who's teaching them to say yes, sir, and no, sir? When's the last time you heard somebody 14 years old say, excuse me? Even our own kids don't do that. They say, hey, get out of the way. I mean, our own kids can do that. And the profanity that is so easily spoken today, the rudeness, the disrespect. Now, I'm going to date myself here. Not that I'm taking myself on a date. Um, so that has happened on occasion. But... I was raised with this, my parents who said, you, you don't call older people by the first name. You call them Mr. or Mrs. That's how we were raised. That, that's how I was raised. Now, if the older person gave you permission, then of course you could call them by the first name, but it would be awkward. It, you know, Mr. As a matter of fact, I'll give you the tr tell you the truth. I, I called my father-in-law Mr. Lopez until, until just before he died. I always spoke with that as a respect. And my mother-in-law, her name is Grace, but I, Mrs. Lopez. I just always have done that. I was taught to do that out of respect for them, even if you feel love and closeness to them. That's just the way I was raised. And, and I wasn't a model kid by any means, but I was taught certain things and all of that. If you went to the doctor and uh, the nurse was to be looking at your chart and speaking to you during that day, she'd say, Mr. Rosales, you know, would you like to be seated? They don't do that anymore. Now you've got a 19-year-old girl snapping her gum saying, hey, Dave, sit down. You know, and it's just different, you know. That's the way it works, right? So, so, but we wonder about the rudeness and everything. I can still remember going to the movies and actually watching a movie, not hearing a running dialogue of the people in front of me. I can still remember going to restaurants where it was quiet, where you actually had a quiet meal. You didn't have to go to a fancy high-dollar restaurant to have a quiet meal. You had that in any restaurant that you went to because it was polite to keep your conversation at your own table. None of that is true today. None of that is true. You know, and, 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 and people complain about that. And I'm not even complaining. I'm just observing. That's the truth. None of that is true today. I mean, if you roll up and you're an older woman and you roll up to a, to a gas pump, there was a time when a young man would have come and helped you with that to make sure that everything was okay. They actually would have pumped the gas for you even if they didn't work at the gas station. That's not what happens now. If you roll up and somebody else is rolling up at the same time, they'll shoot in front of you to make sure they get that <laughs> gas pump first. That's the way it is, and they think it's okay to do that. That's just normal life. And what we've seen is we've seen there's an absence of anybody training children up, and then when you see the great amount of people who aren't home, then you have to ask the question, then who's going to raise the kid? And the person who raised the kid is either on TV or is on the Internet or is one of their friends. And that's a large portion of the reason why we have so many kids who are out of control today because nobody's watching them. I found this interesting. Um, I've heard recently people mocking Laura Bush, President Bush's wife, and, and I consider her to be a genuine lady, a genuine lady, you know, and uh, 
you have to define what a lady is today because you watch the news and they'll say, and the lady killed six people. You know, and last time I heard ladies don't kill people, you know, and the gentleman strangled his mother. You know, gentlemen don't do that, you know. That, but we use those words so loosely today, but I see her as a woman who has class, and she does, and she's gracious, and I believe that she brings honor to the title First Lady. But I was listening to somebody just yesterday who was saying uh, that, that, that she exalts Teresa Hines Carey for speaking her mind. And I'm wondering what, where Teresa Hines Carey's mind is most of the time. She says some of the strangest things. And they, and they look at Hillary Clinton as a model for women, and uh, maybe for some guys, but not for women, you know? And because, I, and this may sound evil and unkind, but I don't see them as models for my daughters. I wouldn't want my daughters to be just speaking their mind. There, there needs to be self-control. There needs to be civility. There needs to be a, a sense of, of dignity, especially if you're going to be holding the office or the position of being called the First Lady of the United States. But we don't have that anymore, you see, and there's a lot of young people say, yeah, I like people who speak their mind and, and say the kinds of things, call people idiots, and, 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 and used a word recently that, that many of you don't even know what that word means, but it's a very filthy word that's been being used on the, on the news, in the news recently, and I won't use that word here in the pulpit, but I have to tell you that the actual definition of the word that was used recently is a, is a vulgar word. And it just comes out and flows so easily and all of that. And, and people admire that. We've got a society that really doesn't understand what's going on. The bottom line is, if, if, if this society is going to ever become better, it's going to become better because God's Word is honored and people actually are doing what God says. And, and if we're going to in any way be able to save the generation coming up, we need to spend a lot of time praying for them and working with these kids and, and communicating. And that's basically what he's talking about here. That they, he says in verse 7, may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments. That's the bottom line. He says parents and grandparents have the responsibility of doing that. We need to share the wonderful works of God. We need to teach our children to praise His name, that we might together be able to see the Lord honored. When he says in verse 8, uh, and may not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, well, God's desire is for His children to be blessed and to trust in Him. The Bible in Amos 5, verse 4 says, uh, Thus saith the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me and live. God doesn't want a, a rebellious and stubborn generation. He wants a generation that does the right thing, a generation who is faithful to God. Verse 9, The children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows, turned back in the day of battle, uh, they did not keep the covenant of God. They refused to walk in His law and forgot His works and His wonders that He had shown them. Now, he speaks of the children of Ephraim. The children of Ephraim, Ephraim being one of the 12 tribes, is a reference to, to, um, to uh, uh, the tribe when it refused to enter into battle, but it's really a picture of rebellion. And so, he's just continuing to say that this is a stubborn and rebellious generation and uses Ephraim as, as an example of that. And verse 12, marvelous things he did in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt in the field of Zoan. He divided the sea and caused them to pass through, and he made the water stand up like a heap. In the daytime also he led them with the cloud and all the night with a light of fire. He split the rocks in the wilderness, gave them drink in abundance like the depths. He also brought streams out of the rock, caused waters to run down like rivers." But they sinned even more against Him by rebelling against the Most High in the wilderness, and they tested God in their heart by asking for the food of their fancy. Yes, they spoke against God. They said, can God prepare a table in the wilderness? Behold, He struck the rock so that waters gushed out and streams overflowed. Can He give bread also? Can He provide meat for His people? So at this point, Asaph begins to remind the people of how God delivered the nation of Israel from Egypt. Because in Jewish history, he's reminded them that the nation of Israel had actually been in, in bondage to Egypt and had spent 430 years there. But God had raised up a deliverer, a man by the name of Moses. And as he's speaking here, he's reminding the children of Israel how that God had done that and how that God brought plagues and all. And you'll see that in some detail in just a moment. But how that God had brought 10 plagues against the Egyptians and ultimately the nation of Israel was allowed, allowed to leave. And, and God had brought those plagues on the nation of Egypt in order that He might judge 
the, uh, the gods of the Egyptians. Now, he speaks concerning verse 16, how he brought, us, he brought streams out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. Assuming that we remember the stories of the children of Israel in the wilderness, we know that as they were wandering through, they became thirsty, and God spoke to Moses and said to him, strike the rock and water will be provided. And that's exactly what took place. He struck the, the rock, and water came out of the rock, and the water was abundant enough to take care of the needs of some guesstimate up to two million people. And so this water gushed out and actually flooded out. That's what he's speaking about in verse 16 when he says he brought streams out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. Because they had livestock and because there was up to two million people there who were wandering through the wilderness, this was an incredible amount of water that was supplied for them, enough for everything and all needs. But what happens? Well, verse 17, they sinned even more against him by rebelling against the Most High in the wilderness. They tested God in their heart by asking for the food of their fancy. They spoke against God. They said, can God prepare a table in the wilderness? Behold, he struck the rock, so the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide meat for his people? He gave us water, but can he provide us something to eat while we're at it? Well, in reality, what happens is they begin to disbelieve in God and they actually continue to rebel. Even though they're in a point of disbelief, God begins to provide for them. As you remember the stories of what took place there, God provided in miraculous ways. Verse 21 tells us, the Lord heard this and was furious. So a fire was kindled against Jacob and anger also came up against Israel. They didn't believe in God, did not trust his salvation. Yes, he commanded the clouds above and opened the doors of heaven. He rained down manna on them to eat given them of the bread of heaven. Men ate angels' food. He sent them food to the full. He caused an east wind to blow in the heavens, and by his power he brought in the south wind. He also rained meat on them like the dust, feathered fowl like the sand of the seas, and he let them fall in the midst of their camp all around their habitations. So they ate and were well filled. He gave them their own, their own desire. They were not deprived of their craving, but while their food was still in their mouths, the wrath of God came against them and slew the stoutest of them and struck down the choice men of Israel. They continued to rebel, even though God was continuing to provide in such miraculous ways. He gave them manna, and he gave them quail to eat, and still they refused to believe and to trust in his ability to save them. And once again, he provides manna and quail, and they continue to judge, to uh, to. Uh, rebel, and therefore he brings judgment against them. Notice verse 32, in spite of this, they still sinned and did not believe in his wondrous works. Therefore, their days he consumed in futility, their years in fear. It amazes me how the Lord can work in our lives and do wonderful things, things that, that will cause our hearts to just, just leap. We say, God, you've been so good. Look at how you've worked in my life. And, and indeed, God does sometimes in your life, I'm sure if we were to sit down and begin to think about all that the Lord has done, all the wonderful things the Lord has done, I'm sure that we could begin to compile stories and even make a book of just the wonderful works of God in our life, the prayers that we've had answered, the blessings and miracles that we've seen in our life, how God has moved on our behalf in so many ways for so long, so faithfully. And yet it seems sometimes that, that God has done one thing in our life, and then, uh, you know, a few days later we're saying, well, where is God now? How come you're not answering my prayer? Why aren't you hearing what I am saying to you, Lord? And like spoiled children, very often we, we fail to remain grateful for too long. Well, God provided for the children of Israel, and that, that's what Asaph is saying. He's saying the Lord provided for them. I mean, think about it for just a moment. They're wandering in the wilderness. They've got two million people, all these cattle and, and, and sheep, all their herds and everything, and they're wandering in the midst of a wilderness, and they've just been delivered through miraculous plagues that God has brought on the nation. We'll see that in just, in just a moment. And, and, and as they're coming out, they're, they've seen God do incredible things, and yet they begin to say, well, we're hungry, and, and we used to enjoy the onions and, and the garlic and, and all the rest that we had there in, in Egypt. Have you brought us out into this wilderness just to die? Why have you brought us here? How come God isn't providing for us? We're thirsty and we're hungry. And God is giving what is called angel's food. It's not angel's food cake. It's, it's angel's food, you know, manna from heaven. 
and, and he's providing for them in a miraculous way. And yet, in spite of all this, he says in verse 32, they sinned, and they did not believe in his wondrous works. Therefore, their days he consumed in futility, their years in fear. Verse 34, when he slew them, then they sought him, and they returned and sought diligently for God. Then they remembered that God was their rock, the Most High God, their Redeemer. You see, when God brought judgment, they would immediately run back to him, but they didn't run back with repentance. They ran back saying, God, help me. There's a difference, and listen carefully, there is a difference between regret and repenting. There's a world of difference between the two. I've seen over the years the difference lived out before me. I have had people come who regret what they have gotten themselves into. They are so sorry about what has happened. They got caught doing something. They got caught stealing on the job and were fired. Or they got themselves involved with a girlfriend or a boyfriend, and, and now there's a pregnancy. They are so sorry for what has happened, and they come with tears. I've, had, I've, I've, I've prayed with people who have tears in their eyes, and they'll tell me, I've had people holding my hands, and they say to me, I'm so afraid I have to stand before the judge this upcoming Tuesday. I have times that I'm going to have to do unless God does something for me, and these people are afraid. And we pray, and we say, God, in Jesus' name. And they come running to the Lord, but not necessarily with, with repentance. They come because they're afraid, and they regret what has happened. There's a difference. You see, because if they don't get off, if they have to do time, then they get mad at God. Or if indeed she's pregnant, and, 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 and it's, you know, there's no way that she's not pregnant, she gets mad at God, as if God is at fault for what they found themselves, well, reaping in terms of the consequences of their decisions and actions. And then they get mad at the Lord. But then I've also seen people who actually repent, and there's a difference between the regretting and repentance. You see, sometimes repentance may not even have an accompanying sorrow in a sense of tears or, or even just an outward remorse. Repentance is a change of mind. It's a decision of the will. It's when you look at what God's Word says and you look at your life and you, and you compare them and you say, God's right and I'm wrong, and you change your mind. That's what the word in Greek means, metanoia. It means change of mind. And when you make that change of mind and you say, you know what, I'm going in the wrong direction, I'm going to go God's way, now you've repented. And when you've repented, it doesn't matter if when you stand before the judge, he sentences you to six months. Because you say, you know what, I deserve this. I did wrong. I'll do my time. And while I'm there, I'm going to make use of it. I'm going to read the Word of God. I'll take some Bible studies. I'll get some tapes. And I'm going to grow as a result of this. Because you know what, I'm reaping what I sowed. And they're not upset. Not to the degree that they were before. Why? Because they repented. And they said, you know what, this is the way it's going to be. And sometimes, and this is what he's speaking about, the children of Israel would find themselves being dealt with by God, and immediately they would run back. God was pouring out judgment. They would run back to him. But it wasn't because they were truly repenting. It was simply because they had gotten themselves into some trouble. And they wanted God to stop dealing harshly with them. We need to know the difference between the two. Continuing in verse 36, Nevertheless, they flattered him with their mouth. They lied to him with their tongue. For their heart was not steadfast with him, nor were they faithful in his covenant, but he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity, did not destroy them. Yes, many a time he turned his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. He remembered that they were but flesh, a breath that passes away and does not come again. And so they flattered with their mouth, but they were really lying, and that reveals how they really felt about it. But God, on the other hand, he says, is filled with compassion. And not only that, he forgives iniquity and doesn't destroy him. Now, his compassion is based on something, and he tells us what it is. Verse 39, his compassion is based on the fact that he knows that they're simply flesh and that they are temporary. They're a breath that passes away and does not come again. 
And so he knows they're weak and he knows they're sinful. And, and with that knowledge, he ministered to them out of his grace. Verse 40, how often they provoked him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. Yes, again and again they tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. They did not remember his power the day when he redeemed them from the enemy, when he worked his signs in Egypt and his wonders in the field of Zoan, turned their rivers into blood, their streams that they could not drink. He sent swarms of flies among them, that must have been in Chino, which devoured them, <laughs> and frogs which destroyed them. He also gave their crops to the caterpillar, their labor to the locust. He destroyed their vines with hail, their sycamore trees with frost. He also gave up their cattle to the hail, their flocks to fiery lightning. He cast on them the fierceness of his anger, wrath, indignation, and trouble. By sending angels of destruction among them, he made a path for his anger. He did not spare their soul from death, but gave their life over to the plague, destroyed all the firstborn in Egypt, the first of their strength in the tents of Ham. But he made his own people go forth like sheep, guided them in the wilderness like a flock, and he led them on safely so that they did not fear. But the sea overwhelmed their enemies, and he brought them to his holy border, this mountain which his right hand had acquired. He also drove out the nations before them, allotted them an inheritance by survey, and made the tribes of Israel dwell in their tents. So he goes through the, tr through the uh, plagues that occurred, the plagues that were actually um, judgments against the gods of Egypt. And he reminds the children of Israel how God had done that, how God had brought all of these plagues, a series of plagues. Now, Pharaoh would not allow the children of Israel to go, and, uh, and his heart was continually hardened uh, against uh, allowing them to go until ultimately God, uh, through a series of these plagues, uh, worked in such a way that the children of Israel were finally not only sent out, but were actually given all this gold and all. It was a back payment for all the years of labor that they'd never been paid for and sent out. And that's the point that he's making here, that God sent them out. They stand there by the Red Sea, and you've heard the story so many times, and as they're by the Red Sea and, and Pharaoh's armies uh, and charioteers are after them and all, and you know how God divides that Red Sea and causes a wind to blow on it, and, and they cross on dry land, and they exit there, and they got away safely while the chariots of Egypt were caught up in, the, in, the, in that sea and ultimately were destroyed. And that's the point that he's making. He's saying they forgot how God set them free. They forgot the works that God had done in their life. They forgot that God not only took them out of slavery, but actually gave them a promised land, a land, he says in verse 55, that is allotted by inheritance through a survey, and God gave them this promised land. Verse 56, yet they tested and provoked the Most High God and did not keep His testimonies, but turned back and acted unfaithfully like their fathers. They were turned aside like a deceitful bow, for they provoked Him to anger with their high places, moved Him to jealousy with their carved images. When God heard this, he was furious, greatly abhorred Israel, so that he forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh, the tent which he had placed among men, delivered his strength into captivity, his glory into the enemy's hand. He also gave his people over to the sword and was furious with his inheritance. The fire consumed their young men. Their maidens were not given in marriage. Their priests fell by the sword and their widows made no lamentation. Continuing on in their history and reminding them of what had happened, he points out in verses 56 through 58 that they tested and provoked the Most High God. They would not keep His testimonies. The people who entered, up, entered into the land of promise were just as faithless as what he's saying. And he goes on to tell us, and notice in verse 58 and 59, that their idolatry actually provoked God to anger. As a result of that, when you study uh, Jewish history, you'll remember that as a result of their idolatry, God actually removed the Ark of the Covenant, which was His presence from amongst the people. I want to, I'll, I'll share a little bit out of verses 63 and 64. Let me share a couple things here. It says, a fire consumed their young men, their maidens were not given in marriage, their priests fell by the sword, and their widows made no lamentation. Very briefly, when you read 1 Samuel, without going through the whole book with you right now, when you get to chapter 4 of 1 Samuel, it's an interesting portion of Scripture that relates to two of the sons of the priest whose name was Eli. 
You see, Eli was a priest of the Most High God. And Eli had two sons, Phinehas and Hophni. Now, Phinehas and Hophni in Scripture were unrighteous priests. They would actually steal sacrifice that was meant for God. And not only were they doing that, but they were also having physical relationships with women who would serve there in the tabernacle. And so they were perverse, twisted sons. Now, God had said to Eli that your sons are disgraceful and the things that they're doing are noted by me and I will deal with them. And so when you study in 1 Samuel in chapter 4, that's exactly what takes place. The Philistines came against the nation of Israel. When they did so, the children of Israel who had the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant is the presence of God amongst the people. And the Philistines knew concerning the Ark of the Covenant that it was the presence of God amongst his people. And so when the children of Israel were aligned for war against the Philistines, the children of Israel, seeing that this was going to be a, a very important battle, uh, brought out the Ark of the Covenant. When they did that, the Philistines, seeing the Ark of the Covenant being rolled out or brought out, began to tremble because they had heard stories of this people who had a God who fought for them. Now, the children of Israel, because they're in sin, don't even realize that God is not on their side. And so what happens is they bring out the Ark of the Covenant, the Philistines look, and they begin to tremble amongst themselves, and they say, oh, no, this is the, this is the gods that, that have been on the side of the people and given them victory over all their enemies. But instead of fleeing, they said, be strong like men and fight, because we will not be servants to Israel. Now, the Jewish people are expecting that God is on their side. So they're going to go to battle and have victory. That's not what takes place. When they go against the Philistines, the Philistines fight against them and not only defeat them in battle, but take the Ark of the Covenant away from the nation of Israel. God allows that to take place as a picture of His, of His, of His presence departing from them because of their sin. And not only does He allow that, but Phineas and Hophni, who have been so sinful, are judged. And as a minister, as I study that passage, it's a warning to me. It's a warning to me to make sure that I remain right with God, that I, that I don't think that just because I uh, have had God on my side before that He's always on my side, I need to realize that He's on my side as long as I'm on His side. But if I begin to do things in the flesh and I begin to take advantage of people and if I begin to do sinful things, then God's going to take His hand off me and take His hand off this ministry. That's what I was trying to say earlier when I mentioned to you that, that on Sunday the power went out and we all sat in darkness. And the Lord was reminding me that without His light and without His power, even if physical lights are on, people will remain in darkness. And so God is reminding the children of Israel in their history that they rebelled against Him. And when they did so, He removed His presence from them and actually brought judgment Verse 65, then the Lord awoke as one out of sleep, and like a mighty man who shouts because of wine, he beat back his enemies. He put them in perpetual reproach. Moreover, he rejected the tent of Joseph, did not choose the tribe of Ephraim. He chose the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, which he loved. He built a sanctuary like the heights, like the earth which he has established forever. He also chose David, his servant. That's me. No. And... Uh, took him from the sheepfolds. From following the ewes that had young, he brought him to shepherd Jacob his people and Israel his inheritance. So he shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillful, skillfulness of his hands. Do you see the contrast? Verse 64, their priests fell by the sword, their widows made no lamentation. 
Do you see the contrast between that and verse 72? David shepherded them according to integrity and skillfulness. As a shepherd king, David was taken from humble beginnings. He was just a young boy caring for his father's flock when Goliath, the giant Philistine, nine feet nine, challenged the nation of Israel. Do you remember the story? How that Goliath would come out and say how senseless it would be for two armies to fight when all it's really going to require is two soldiers. I'll represent the Philistines. You send your chief warrior out, and uh, whoever wins, well, the losers are going to serve the winners. Makes sense to me. And every day this nine-foot-nine nine giant would step out and mock the armies of God. David had some brothers who were there in the battlefield. They were older than he. David was there in the, taking care of the, the sheep and all when his father Jesse said, take some food to your brothers there. And uh, that's what he does. And he shows up. And when he shows up, it just so happens that Goliath is walking out. And David sees this enormous warrior walking out, challenging the nation of Israel. And, and he gets upset. Who is this uncircumcised heathen to defy the armies of the living God? Who is this person? They say, that's Goliath, man. Don't let him hear you. And his brothers say, you naughty boy, you're out here just to see the battle. David says, what have I done to you? And he says, what's going on here? And then they tell him. So he says, I'll fight him. I'll fight him. I take care of sheep. You know, when, when a bear has come or, or, or a wolf, I, a lion, I've taken care of him with my own hands. Uh, he's no, no, no more difficult to deal with than, than the things that I've already overcome. Now, now, Saul is the king, and, and, and Saul says, um, I really don't think that's a good idea. You see, you're just a boy, and he's been a warrior from his youth. And, and, and David says, listen, you know what? I'm going to take care of this. So Saul says, well, you know, cool. Here's my armor. Now, Saul was head and shoulders above all the children of Israel, meaning he was the biggest man in Israel. So you picture Saul, who is a very large man himself, handing this enormous armor to this young shepherd boy. And you can see David standing there saying, you know, this isn't going to work. And so he takes off the armor of Saul, and he says, I'll go with what I have. And he has a sling, and he brings five smooth stones. And he steps out there, and there's Goliath making his noise again. And David, the Bible says, runs towards Goliath. And as he's running towards Goliath, Goliath is saying, come on to me. He says, and I'm going to, I'll feed your flesh to the birds today. And as he does that, David says, you know what? You've defied the, the living God. And, and this day, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill you. And I'm going to take your head off. And I'm going to feed your flesh to the birds. Now, you could almost see the army of Israel and the Philistines as they're watching this confrontation. Here comes this little guy running towards this nine-foot-nine nine guy. But as David's running, he's pulling out a smooth stone, and he starts to swing it in his hand. And Goliath is there just thinking, no problem. And whoosh, there it goes right into his forehead. And when it hits him in the forehead, you know, strike, the guy goes down. Boom. And he's laying on the ground. David pulls out Goliath's sword, chops his head up, holds it up, and says, nani, nani, nani. I win, <laughs> you lose. Now, what's interesting about that is somebody says, well, David had five smooth stones, but he only used one on Goliath. Yeah, but Goliath had four brothers. It was Goliath and your family. That's what he was saying. I'll take you, and I'll take your brothers, too. I'll take you, and I'll take any enemy of God. Now, that is a man of faith. So you have, on the one hand, unfaithful priests, Hophni and Phinehas. On the other hand, you have a young man by the name of David who's a shepherd. But David, according to 1 Samuel 13, 14, was a man after God's own heart. And God would prefer a young shepherd who had a heart for sheep and loved to sing songs in the wilderness to God. He preferred someone like that over these who were from the priestly line. So God, instead of using Levi, actually chooses Judah. David was from the tribe of Judah. 
and uses him as a model of a shepherd king, one who has integrity and one who has skill. Because he's a picture of our Messiah, Jesus Christ, who is the true shepherd king who ministers with righteousness and skillfulness. Because it's said of Jesus Christ in, in Mark chapter 7, verse 37, he does all things well. And so David is a great picture of that. And Asaph is reminding us. He's saying, you have a history, Israel, where God gave you a command to take all of his word and to hand it to your children. But as a nation, you have rebelled over and over and over again. You have even had ungodly priests who forgot how God delivered you from Egypt. But God gave to you a righteous king in David who had skill and integrity. And by the way, prophetically, that's a picture of Jesus Messiah who has skill and righteousness as he leads and cares for us. Psalm 78. Let's pray.